in a 4,000 year old book with many references to natural phenomena. It's, a, it's very impressive that the Bible has no scientific errors and that it was frequently ahead of its time in correctly describing and predicting scientific and technological realities thousands of years in advance. It often reveals scientific truths that only been discovered recently in modern times. The Bible accurately anticipated many scientific discoveries and even foresaw a number of inventions. And sometimes, you see, God's prophets, in seeing the future, describe and predict modern technology in the connection with the events of the end times. At the time it was written, it was beyond man's ability to even imagine that things w such things were possible. And so this is a clear sign of divine inspiration. Of course, the writers of Scripture couldn't use modern scientific words for their descriptions, such as radio, satellite, television, computers, cars, tanks, aeroplanes. You know, these modern names didn't exist then. So they had to choose words from their own experience that corresponded the best to the revelation they were receiving. Even so, the way their descriptions correspond to the realities and uh, to modern discoveries and inventions is remarkable. Often it must have seemed to the original hearers that these descriptions were impossible to take literally. But now they make perfect sense to us. And so the Bible describes and predicts modern technological developments in such a way that we can easily identify their fulfillment once these inventions were made. And this is either amazing coincidence and luck or by divine design. Next we're going to look at the rapid transportation and worldwide travel and communications uh, predicted that would be normal in, uh, and uh, it would be for many in the end times. Daniel 12 verse 4, O Daniel, shut up the words of this prophecy and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run or rush or travel rapidly to and fro across the earth, and as a result, knowledge shall be increased. This predicts that at the time of the end, it will be characterized by many, not just a few, being able to travel rapidly from place to place on the earth. This requires new means of transportation available to the masses. The world has indeed changed and become smaller over the last 150 years with the invention of trains, cars, and then planes. These developments are unique in history and constitute a sign of the end times according to this verse. This has happened in conjunction with another way modern man goes to and fro across the earth through electronic communications. Whether by telegraph, radio, telephone, TV, internet, we can send our thoughts and our images across the world almost instantaneously. And this ability to travel and communicate at great speed across the earth isn't just for the few, but for the many. That is, it's become part of normal life, just as Daniel described. The ability to travel and a worldwide sharing of information has greatly aided the exponential increase of knowledge that we saw, that Daniel predicted would result from this toing and froing at high speeds across the earth in the end times. We take all these things for granted, but a moment of reflection will reveal how different life has become in the last hundred years through our ability to travel and communicate at great speeds across great distances and through the great increase of scientific knowledge. These are special conditions unique in all history of man and they agree perfectly with Daniel's prophecy of what it will be like in the end times. His prophecy has indeed come to pass. What an explosion of knowledge there's been in the last hundred years. It doubles every two years and the continual increase of knowledge is, is connected, you see, to these improving communications to and fro across the earth through electricity, phone, computers, satellites, internet and so on, as well as physical transport like trains and planes and so forth. The staggering numbers of those running to and fro on trains and subways alone are at least a hundred billion a year. There are a hundred thousand commercial air flights a day worldwide. Surely Daniel 12.4 is being fulfilled and we can be sure we are living in the end times. The ability to travel and communicate easily to and fro across the earth fits another prediction by Jesus of what will happen in the end times. He said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations and then the end shall come. The worldwide preaching of the gospel to all people groups in the end times requires the ability to travel easily to the ends of the earth and for a worldwide communications network. To prepare the way for all this, the time leading up to the end times must see a great increase in technology, especially communications and travel. 
And this is what's happened in our time. We're not to see these technologies uh, as evil and avoid them, but we are to use them for the glory of God. We need to enlist them as tools to help us get the job done of getting the gospel out to the ends of the earth. The Bible predicts great scientific advances in the end times. So therefore, the recent explosion of scientific and technological advances are a clear sign that we are living in the end times. In the next sections, we're going to see specific examples of advanced technology which the Bible predicts will exist in the end times. First of all, motorized transport in the form of cars, armored vehicles, tanks even. Nahum 2 says the chariots, metal armored vehicles, came come with flaming torches, headlights, in the day of his preparation, and this is a reference to the end time period of judgment just before the Lord returns, and the spears, projectile weapons, are brandished, the chariots rage in the streets, they jostle one another in the broad roads, in the highways, they seem like torches, they run like lightning, he says. Even though there was an initial fulfillment of his prophecy in the destruction of Nineveh in 612 BC, as with all the prophets, he always looked to an end time fulfillment as well. In the day of the Lord, what's called here the day of preparation, that is the day of preparation for the Lord's return, when history comes to its climax. The immediate short-term fulfillment is a type of the ultimate end time fulfillment. A few verses earlier, God promised Israel, the wicked one shall no more pass through you, he will be utterly cut off. This will only be fulfilled in the future, indicating an ultimate end time fulfillment. Although the language of chariots, metal vehicles with flaming torches, headlights, moving at high speeds, running like lightning, and jostling one each other on broad roads or highways, it could be seen as a poetic description of an ancient battle. One can't help but get the impression that the prophet is describing something that is strange to him, that he saw in a vision and he's trying to relate it to us in the best way that he can using the language at his disposal. Even if there was an initial poetic fulfillment, it could only be literally fulfilled by a future battle involving modern technology. For example, they run like lightning doesn't really fit a horse-drawn chariot. In fact, the language here describing future transportation and warfare in the end times agrees amazingly well with what we know in the modern age. It's impressive that when the language used by Nahum is taken literally, it's a perfect fit with rapid modern chariots, whether cars or tanks, uh, traveling on wide roads and highways and bustling city centers. The chariots, metal vehicles, come with flaming torches, headlights in the day of his preparation. The chariots, or cars, rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning at high speeds. The chariots, metal armored vehicles with flaming torches, maybe missiles firing, and the spears, projectile ve weapons, are brandished. The chariots, cars, rage in the streets, they jostle one another in the broad roads, in the highways. They seem like torches, they run like lightning. If Nahum saw the future in a vision, seeing modern streets and jostling traffic in city centers and armored cars and tanks in a modern battle, and then he put it in his words, then these verses would be as good a description as he could make. Now we go on to the invention of aeroplanes, and this was anticipated in a prophecy that was dramatically fulfilled in 1917. Isaiah predicted that J Jerusalem would be defended from the air by aeroplanes. He says, as birds flying, or aeroplanes flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over he will preserve it. This is wonderfully fulfilled in 19. 17 in World War I, soon after aeroplanes were invented. They were used for the first time on a large scale in this great war of the f 1914 to 18. Of course, Isaiah had no word for aeroplanes, so he had to use the closest equivalent word, which is birds. Clearly, literal birds couldn't save a city from destruction, so they must be symbolic of things that fly like a bird. Surely this, therefore, anticipates the invention of aeroplanes. God is saying in the end times he will preserve Jerusalem by military aircraft flying over her. This was a significant end time event, fulfillment of prophecy. You see, Jesus predicted that Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled.
According to Daniel, these times of the Gentiles were seven times or 2,520 years of Gentile dominion over Jerusalem. They started with Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, followed by Persia, Greece, and Rome. And for the second half of these seven times, the last 1,300 years, Jerusalem was under Islamic control. And for the last 400 years there, was in the, under the Turkish Ottoman Empire. But a great uh, evangelist called Grattan Guinness pointed out a few years before this that 1917 should be a key year in the ending of the times of the Gentiles, being exactly at the end of 2,520 years from 604 BC. And since these were about to expire, many Bible believers were looking for something significant to happen in 1917, which would mark the release of Jerusalem from her Gentile domination and open the way for the prophesied rebirth of Israel. And they weren't to be disappointed. In 1917, the Christian general, British general J Allenby, um, was bringing his army up from Egypt into towards Jerusalem. And uh, it was just uncanny the way Jerusalem was defended and delivered from, air, from destruction by aircraft, just as Isaiah prophesied about birds flying over, delivering Jerusalem. And to understand it, you need to know the special story going on here. Alan B., you see, was given orders to liberate Jerusalem. He was reluctant, though, to do a full attack because this was a sacred city and he didn't want it to be destroyed. So he ordered there to be no fighting. He even asked the king for advice and the king just telegraphed back and said, pray. So he called a prayer meeting of his officers and he opened the Bible and it came to Isaiah 31 to this very prophecy where it told him what to do. And the verse before actually talks about God being as a lion. And of course the lion was the emblem of the British empire. And, and that God would use this lion. And then it talked about how God would deliver Jerusalem by birds flying over it. And based on this, he decided to fly planes over Jerusalem, dropping leaf leaflets in the Turkish language, instructing them to surrender the city. And it was signed Allenby. The interesting thing is that in Arabic, this phrase um, is much like Allah Nebi, which means God's prophet. And so they had never seen aeroplanes before. Many became fearful, especially with this message from God's prophet. And uh, their fears were magnified by that. And he had almost entirely surrounded the city. He just left one route of escape because he wanted to escape them to escape and then he could engage them somewhere else. That way the city wouldn't be destroyed. And he wanted them to leave under pressure so they wouldn't have time to destroy the buildings and so on. And so, by birds flying overhead. And that's exactly what happened when they got afraid and then they left the city and, they, and it got surrendered the next day. And it was, so it was preserved from a military attack by the British. It was preserved and delivered from the Turks and it had come out from being under Islamic domination. And uh, it's interesting also that the 14th Bomber Squadron destroyed the batteries of the Turkish artillery to the north which were about to bombard the city. And so Jerusalem was indeed as fulfillment of prophecy as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. There's a book written called As Birds Flying that describes this situation, the miraculous nature of Jerusalem's deliverance from destruction um, by the British or by the Turks is emphasized that she, Jerusalem is the one city in the world war uh, in the action that came through totally unscathed. God had used the, the bomber squadron to play this decisive role. And the interesting thing is it had been a, given a motto two years before, which is, I spread my wings and keep my promise. And indeed, God kept his promise of Isaiah 31 to protect Jerusalem by spreading his wings over Jerusalem. Moreover, in 19, uh, month, one month before in November, just um, the British government had aligned itself with God's promise to Israel to deliver it from it, Gentile domination and to restore it as a nation by making its own promise in the historic Balfour Declaration that said that Britain supported the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of that object. And that way we aligned ourselves, you see, with God's promise and purposes. And so God could use us to fulfill his promise to protect and liberate Jerusalem. And he did it with birds flying over. 
when we took control of the land and the city, it wasn't um, to do it for ourselves, but to hand it over eventually to the Jewish people, rather than being the next in the line of a bunch of conquerors. And so it was a major fulfillment of prophecy of the ending, you see, of the times of the Gentiles, bringing them to their close. God's overruling power in this is seen that the Turks actually had a saying, boasting that Islam will always control the land. They said, when the waters of the Nile flow into Palestine, then <laughs> will a prophet of the Lord come and drive the Turks out of this land. But this was fulfilled because to supply our troops crossing the desert, the waters of the Nile were piped, laid under a pipeline from under the Suez Canal across the, the desert. Uh, and so the waters of the Nile indeed did flow into Palestine, many thousands of gallons a day. And the man who drove out the Turks, as we saw, is Allenby, which in Arabic is prophet of God. And so by that name he was known. And so the waters of the Nile did flow into the land, and a prophet of God did drive the Turks out of the land. And so in the, we've, it was also discovered that when the prayer, in the prayer book being read all over the, the British Empire, the Bible reading on that day was Isaiah 31. Well, finally, on 11th of December 1917, General Allenby, at the head of the British forces, rode up to the Jaffa Gate, dismounted and humbly led his men on foot as the deliverer of the city, liberating it from Turkish control, not as a conqueror, but as a servant, come to fulfill God's, Britain's promise in the Balfour Declaration. Britain didn't annex the land for itself, but administered it under a mandate from the League of Nations until Israel's rebirth in 1948. The way you see God miraculously uh, fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, delivering Jerusalem as birds flying and passing over it, causing the surrender without a fight, at this key moment, at the end of the times of the Gentiles, just before her, Israel's rebirth as a nation, he confirms that God deliberately chose this language. This was fulfilled. And he deliberately chose this language to describe the role that the modern invention of aeroplanes would, would play. And so looking back at the events of 1917, we can see the Bible anticipated the invention of the aeroplane in the end times. The rebirth of Israel, of course, being the major sign of being in the end of the age. And, uh, and it predicted the important role that planes would, pl in the would play in future warfare. Well, let's go to see that worldwide satellite TV is also predicted in Revelation chapter 11. We've already seen from Daniel that the end times will be characterized by rapid worldwide communications. And here we have an e a precise example of this when the death and resurrection of the two end time witnesses takes place in Jerusalem it will be broadcast across the whole world and it will be seen by the whole world at one time. And this requires the invention, you see, of worldwide satellite TV, something that's only come to pass in recent times. Let's have a look at that. Revelation 11:7. when the two witnesses finish their testimony, the beast or antichrist that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the broad place of the great city where our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. The broad place is the Temple Mount. Then it says, then, then those from all the peoples, all the tribes, tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. So for three and a half days, all the people over the whole world will see their dead bodies lying on the Temple Mount in real time. They'll see it in real time, you see. Over those three and a half days, that's only possible through live TV. And then it says, and all those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another, for these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on all those who saw them. So this is happening on live TV. All the peoples of the earth will witness this resurrection. And they heard a loud sh sh voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in the cloud and their enemies saw them. They saw, they would have heard this voice from heaven and they will see him ascend, see them ascending all on live TV. This prophecy absolutely requires the invention of a worldwide 
visual communication system in the end times that today, of course, we know as television. The impressive nature of this foresight is increased when you consider how impossible and counterintuitive it must have seemed to the original writer and readers that the whole world will be able to see these events in real time. Let's go on to the invention of computers in the end times. That's required by the worldwide implementation of the mark of the beast. Revelation 13 says, He, that's the false prophet, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, the Antichrist or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, 666. You see, the Antichrist will be able to take control of all financial transactions by making everyone take a mark in their body, signifying their total submission to him. And only by having this mark will anyone be able to buy or sell. So this mark will be essential to conducting any legal financial transaction. The implementation of this system on a worldwide scale requires advanced computer technology. In fact, only recently has such a system even become possible. Uh, we can now conceive it, how it would work. The mark would include an implanted computer chip that would function as a personal ID and probably location device and as a credit card for all financial transactions in a cashless society and thus it will be a means of controlling the masses. And anyone who refuses to swear loyalty and worship this Antichrist and take his mark will be killed. Today's credit cards and barcodes are not the mark, of course, but the technologies involved in their development will eventually be used for the mark. It's interesting that all barcodes have the appearance of 666 built into them. Ultimately, taking the mark will mean denying the true God and giving all allegiance to the beast state and its dictator. Without the mark, they'll be excluded from society and under the threat of death for treason. With advancing computer technology, the capability is growing now for a big brother government to have complete records on every person controlling all financial transactions. We can see the growth of a global economic network and the potential use of injected computer chips to facilitate and record financial transfers, thus preventing fraud. It will seem to have a good purpose when it's brought in. These things will allow an evil dictator to set up an integrated system of total global control, the mark of the beast. Again, you see, the Bible correctly predicts the rise of advanced technologies in the end times. In this case, the mark of the beast requires computers, miniaturization, scanners, and a global communication network for it to work so that all financial transactions are brought under one system. It's amazing, you see, to see how the world system, with all its accelerating technological advances, is moving towards the very climax prophesied 2,000 years ago in the book of Revelation. Let's look at the applications now of electricity and light. In Job 38, God asked Job a very strange question. Can you send out lightnings or electrical currents or flashes of light that they may go and say to you, here we are? This doesn't even seem to make good sense, that lightning or light can be sent and then manifest itself in speech. However, this divine question contains the seeds of the scientific discoveries that has moved society into the modern age. The use of electricity and electromagnetic waves, light. From this has sprung actually all the electrical devices that we have and the range of modern communications, radio, phone, internet, TV. Now, God, you see, in, this, in Job was giving man some hints as to what's possible, although it's taken us a long time to work it out. Ben Franklin discovered the nature of electricity and showed that lightning was actually a form of electricity. So the word lightning here is the right word to use to describe electricity. So this verse talks about the way electricity can be used to fulfill certain tasks. In this verse, lightning acts as an obedient servant. First, God gives the key to its, its successful use. It always flows in a circuit. Notice the lightning or electricity is sent out and then quickly returns to the sender and in so doing it accomplishes what it was sent to do. This is the fundamental fact of electricity. 
And then this verse anticipates that messages can be sent by electricity and by light. It says that lightnings or electricity can be used for communication. It can be sent and then manifest itself in speech. It describes the electrical and electromagnetic transmission of information that today is the basis for all our modern communication systems. God was giving us a pointer, you saying, saying, you know, I know how to do it. Can you do it, Job? One of the most important discoveries of modern science is that electrical currents may be used to transmit information with lightning speed. For example, with a telephone, the sound vi vibrations of our voice are converted into corresponding oscillating electrical currents, which can then be sent or transmitted at great speeds through wires to the receiving end, where they're converted back to sound, fulfilling God's words to Job. Thirdly, the Hebrew word primarily refers to lightning, that's electricity, but it also has a secondary meaning of a flash of light, like when a sword glitters in the sun. This indicates a deep connection between electricity and light, which was one of the great discoveries in modern times. In 1864, the Bible-believing genius, <laughs> James Clark Maxwell, in unifying electricity and magnetism in his field equations, showed that light waves, radio waves, microwaves were all electromagnetic oscillations moving at the speed of light. All these electromagnetic waves are basically the same thing, except they have different frequencies. Maxwell showed that electricity and light are closely related. They are different manifestations of the same thing. Therefore, this scripture says that you can send out electromagnetic waves, light, carrying information which then manifests itself at the destination. This means we are not limited to sending messages by oscillating currents in wires, but we can also convert these electrical os oscillations into electromagnetic waves, which can then travel at the speed of light through the atmosphere to their destination. That is why you can have instantaneous wireless communication with someone on the other side of the earth. Sound waves and pictures can be converted into electrical oscillations and then piggybacked onto electromagnetic waves, such as radio waves or microwaves waves, bounced off satellites if necessary, then converted back to electrical oscillations at the other end, which are then used to cre recreate the original sound and picture. Today, you see, using radio, TV, mobile phone transmitters, we send electromagnetic lightnings, which are then manifested as speech and pictures at the other end, just as God described in Job. Can you send out lightnings or light that they may go speedily and say, here we are? Thus the Bible anticipated the modern invention of devices that could transmit messages and pictures over vast distances at the speed of light. The fulfillment of this verse in modern, lightning fast communications, electronic communications has totally transformed the world, connecting it together in so many ways, making it a much smaller place. God could hardly have chosen a more important topic for the science exam that he gave Job. The Bible spoke of these inventions thousands of years before their discovery by science. No other ancient book claiming divine inspiration has such a record of scientific accuracy and foresight.